so hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Felipe, here with me my colleague Ruslan. And we will be presenting Cobrix, a COBOL data source for Spark. So it's going to be kind of a technical conversation here for you to understand the proposition. Um, so the outline is this, we will present ourselves, okay? And then the motivations behind this project. Then we will we'll do a deep dive into how the project works, how Cobrix works. And then we will show some performance results that we found, and then how this whole thing plays into the ABSA uh, big data space. So this is what we have. Um, so we are both big data engineers at ABSA, and uh, we are based in Prague, Czech Republic. And we have Apache Spark and Hadoop at the very core of our uh, data engineering initiatives. Sometimes we find some gaps in the Hadoop ecosystem, and when we find those and we are able to actually fill them, we contribute back to the community. So here are some examples of projects that we have developed. So we have developed tools to do uh, lineage tracking, uh, connect Spark to Avro and Schema Registry, and facilitate data sources integrations, uh, libraries for data quality, for data conformance, Cobrix itself, and we have also contributed to Core Spark, some contributions there. Okay. Um, and now we get into the motivations. So usually when we think about mainframes, we think about dinosaurs and stuff, because it, it, it's considered to be uh, old technology, but it's far from being the truth. So we have done some research, and here we have some very interesting numbers. So if you see, 71% of these Fortune 500 companies, they rely on mainframes. 87% of all credit card transactions in the world are processed by mainframes. Okay? Uh, they are part of 92 out of the 100 biggest banks in the world, ABSA among those. So when we talk about big data, we are talking about mainframes. Okay? Data is there. If you consider the financial industry, insurance industry, governments, they rely heavily on mainframes. But since we are in this era um, in which e e every company wants to become data-centric, if we rely on mainframes to do this job, it, it becomes prohibitively expensive because you have the cost for hardware, licenses, and you also have uh, the, the, the business model, which is based on MIPS, millions of instructions per second. So if you're running uh, machine learning algorithms on top of that business model, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Okay, so this is what we have uh, from a business perspective. Now, we also have a technical motivation. Inside ABSA, uh, we have this process to get data from mainframe into HDFS so that we can apply data science uh, um, technologies. And the process goes like this, so we get this into a PC, then we have to transform it into fixed length uh, text files so you understand more about it in a while. Then you get it into CSV, then into HDFS, so it's an ETL. And you see, for a 600 gigabyte uh, file, it takes 11 days, usually. So we have been able to bring it to actually one hour. There is a, a spoiler alert there. But this is, the, this is the, the situation right now. And we are talking, in, this is technically uh, the reason uh, for this, technically speaking, is that we have these legacy data models, so they are hierarchical. It's quite hard to actually implement them in a distributed way. And uh, so also, as a motivation, we need performance, we need scalability, flexibility in order, that in order to address these uh, concepts related to big data, so velocity, variety, volume, and, and so on. So right now, what can you do, and actually what most companies do? So you can run analytics or Spark on top of mainframes, but you have the price tag associated. Same as uh, with message brokers that allow you to get data from mainframes into uh, another, another things. Uh, you, you have Apache Scoop, which is quite good, but it, it's more for ingestion and it doesn't play very well with hierarchical structures. Or you have the proprietary solutions, quite expensive. So if you put all of this uh, in a basket, you get these uh, constraints, let's call it like this. So these are pricey initiatives. They are somehow slow. Um, they are complex because of the hierarchical structures you understand in a while. 
And also, you require lots of human involvement. So as part of that process that uh, I've just shown, so you have to program each of those steps. And uh, if you put all of these in a basket, you, you get the whole solution to be actually pricey and slow and complicated. So based on those motivations and those constraints, we have developed uh, Cobricks. And basically, our main intention here is to decrease the amount of human involvement. We want to simplify the manipulation of hierarchical structures. You understand how. And uh, by putting that on, on top of Spark, we, we provide scalability. And since Spark is open source, you get read from the, 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 the high price tag of this equation. Okay, so understanding having or having understood how or what are the motivations behind this project, we are now getting into uh, what Cobrix actually is from a technical perspective, and, and Rusan will introduce it. Okay, so um, I'd like now to introduce you to Cobrix and uh, the place it in, in this. Uh, how can you use it in Spark to, to load your data from a mainframe? So this is a high-level overview. So a Spark, a Spark, as you know, probably of course, is a general purpose computational distributed framework. And um, it operates on a different levels. And we chose to operate on a SQL level structured, uh, structured API. And for, the, for uh, that purpose, Cobrix plays the role of a external data source that you can plug uh, a mainframe data into. And you can then load it in Spark and process it using distributed uh, resilience scalable way. Uh, so um, the fact that uh, mainframe data uh, cannot be just simply loaded and transformed because of the specifics of the, uh, of the structure, sometimes it requires transformations before actually writing to the output file. So we are going to uh, take a, a look at this, all those components in detail, and uh, <coughs> take a look at an example of that. So let me first introduce you to just a, a bit of mainframe terms uh, that you need to understand in order to uh, uh, understand how we, how we work with mainframe data. So the first two concepts are very simple ones. There is a data file, a binary data file that comes from mainframe, and a copy book is a schema definition. Although it's very simple, there is a caveat on that. So the word file in our PC world and in mainframe world may actually mean the different things. Uh, so in our in PC world, a file is just a blob of bytes that we can open, read, write, and, and, and close. But on mainframes, a file can be a set of records that can be queried. So it's like more like a database. And uh, because of that, when we say we copy a file from a mainframe, what actually may happen is that we need to retain this record set structure when transferring the file. And the tool that does this, uh, to, in order to retain this structure, it adds additional information to the file itself. So then you copy a file from a mainframe, you copy a file. Uh, it's tool dependent, so tool adds some additional information. <coughs> so a copy book is a sch schema definition, similar to other, uh, similar to uh, network protocol interface definition formats like Thrift, Proto, Buffer, Arbor, for instance. So here is an example of a simple simple data structure uh, defined in those uh, languages. Uh, the difference is that um, network protocols were designed for schema evolution, uh, compatibility, type, uh, generic types, and, and simplicity, uh, while COBOL is designed for uh, easy to use from mainframes and save as much space as possible and to be as flexible as possible. So in COBOL, in copybook, for each field, for instance, for string fields, you need to specify the maximum uh, characters the string can hold, or the maximum array elements uh, a field can contain. So that's a difference. <coughs> so once you have it, once you have a copybook that completely matches the binary data, which is very important, since a uh, copybook defines data structure very precisely, uh, just one missed byte can make the data unreadable. So once you have this, a, a copy book and the data file, uh, then you, you can use Cobrix just naturally in Spark. As you, you know, uh, for Spark, the entry point is a Spark session, which is denoted Spark here. We just 
use read, specify format as COBOL, and specify a mandatory option copybook. And then you can specify the location, all the contents, contents of the copybook itself. And you load and specify the location of the data file or a directory of the files. And then, uh, in the most simple cases, what you get is the a data frame, the initial data frame, which is <coughs> like immutable table, considered like this. Okay. So this is an example of of a fully distributed, scalable, resilient application. So uh, I, I removed the boilerplate like imports and uh, main object, but this is all you need to do. The Spark API hides the complexity of dis distributedness, scalability, and fault tolerance uh, in the, such a small application. Of course, this is for a very simple case. Let's, let's consider more complicated cases. <coughs> So one of the specifics of the mainframe is so-called redefined fields. So if you're familiar with mainframes, you probably heard the term. So redefined fields is fields are, are fields that uh, uh, that are stored at the same storage space or at the same places in memory. If we're talking about the data in memory, so let's have a look at the, an example. So for instance, if we are like a bank, we contain a database. Uh, containing the list of all of our clients. And let's consider that for, for the sake of this example, an, an, an entity can either be a company or a person, but not both. And we have this Boolean is company that can be used to distinguish whether current record is a company or a person. <coughs> and you see that company contains only one field, company name is 40 bytes. And person contains two fields, first name and last name, containing two, uh, 20 bytes each. So <coughs> it's naturally, if you want to save space, uh, to make those two structure fields to be placed at the same storage space layout. And COBOL allows you to do this using redefined fields. So here, persons redefines company. That means uh, if you write something to company name, the same bytes will go to first and last name. Of course, for each record, only one of those fields has a meaning. The other fields are meaningless. So how can we load such, such data uh, in Spark, which does not support such kind of ideas? <coughs> and what Cobrix does, it parses every field as if all of them are valid. It tries hard to parse everything. Of course, it ha might, might happen that uh, a field, for instance, has some kind of numeric packed format that is not valid if uh, another redefined is valid. So that in that case, we get a null value in the field. But otherwise, if it's possible to parse the data, it will do it. And when we uh, do it like this, we'll end up with this table like a bellow. So we have a set of records. But for some records, only company fields are valid. And for some of the records, only person fields are valid. So what can we do about it? So we need additional cleanup after we load this. And the Spark is very easy achievable. So we, we, we can use uh, Spark API itself. We, specify, uh, we select to specify columns that we want to uh, project and uh, use when and otherwise to filter out the fields that are not invalid depending on our distinguisher, which is, is company Boolean. And <coughs> when we do it, we end up with a table that uh, looks like this. We have nulls for companies for first name and last name. We have nulls for company name for persons. And this uh, is quite a right uh, table to have. Uh, when we export such a table into a JSON format, for instance, those fields will be just absent from the, from the documents. So it looks all right. But <coughs> redefines play a very important role in loading so-called hierarchical database data which we're going to look at. So what is hierarchical databases? So hierarchical model was uh, very common on the 50s and 60s before relational model was invented in the 70s. And it, it's, it's, still, it's still used today, especially on mainframes. And, and in APSA, we have a lot of uh, hierarchical databases. So what is hierarchical database? So hierarchical database have several schemas for different levels of hierarchy. So let's take a look at the example. So let's say we have a company, a list of companies, and each company can have zero or more contact people. So company 
is a record that has its own schema, which we called root segment in mainframe terms. And each company can have contact people, which is a, a child segment in, ter in mainframe terms. And uh, this hierarchical structure, the parent-child relationship, is maintained by the database. <coughs> so how can we load this database uh, to Spark? So first thing we need to do is to craft a copybook that contains all of the segments as already defined fields. This is the first step. Sometimes you have this copybook already because it's used in the mainframe like so. But sometimes you need to combine co copybooks for different schemas into one copybook. So in our example, our copybook contains three sections. So the first section is the common data, a fields that have the placement and the names at the same uh, in all of the segments. So segment ID in our case and company ID are fields that are present in both segments. And then comes segment-specific fields. So company contains only fields that, uh, ha uh, that are in the root segment, in company segment, and contact is, is a, a field that contains only fields from contact segment. And you notice that contact redefines the company. So we need all of the segments redefine each other. Such a copybook. <coughs> so when we grab this, this copybook, in order to load a, ma a mainframe file from a hierarchical database, the only thing we need to do is add another option, is rec record sequence true. <coughs> what, what this option, what does it mean? So um, because each segment of, of the data, depending on the segment type, has different length, the file is effectually variable length. One segment goes after the other, and they have different lengths. So in order to restore, to read all of, the, all of those records, we need to utilize headers that are either embedded in the data file itself, or are introduced by the tool that used for copying file from mainframe to uh, a PC. And this option uh, says that we should look for, up for, for such headers. <coughs> But when we do this, we'll end up with this big data frame that contains, in one table, it contains both types of records. So it contains companies and contacts, but depending on the segment type, you see if the segment type is C, which means company, the company struct field is valid and the contact is not. And for segment ID equals P, a company segment is invalid and the contact uh, segment is valid. So what? We need to do some kind of cleanup similar to what we have done in our example with the companies and persons. So for hierarchical database, it's very natural to, if, if our target, if our sync is a relational database, it's very natural to uh, split uh, all the companies into one table and contact people to another table instead of just cleaning up nested structs with nulls. So let's do that. Uh, to read root segment, we just specify, we just filtering by the segment ID. So we know that segment ID specifies uh, the segment. So if it equals to C, it means the current record is a company. And we select only fields that are valid for companies. And we doing so, we also flatten our structure. So you see our final table does not contain, contain nested structs. It's already flattened. And we do similar thing for, for child segments. So we uh, filter out by segment ID, specifying P, and specifying fields that are valid for contact people. <coughs> so if our target is a relational database, this is, at this point, probably sufficient what we need to do. So we, we can export those two tables to a relational database, and we are done. But if our target is a document storage, it's better to denormalize the data, to combine uh, those tables into uh, to a document kind of structure. So we c what we can do, it, we can utilize this company ID field uh, to join those tables into one big denormalized table. In Spark, it's very easy to do. Once you have those uh, two initial tables, you use Spark join. We use outer join because we want to retain companies that do not have contact people. And once we are done, we end up with this denormalized table. And then 
Then we have this big denormalized table. We can use utilize Spark uh, group by and collect list to gather all the companies into the root level and place contacts as a nested array inside the contacts field. Doing so will make our records look exactly like a <coughs> document in the document storage. So we can export it to a, any document-oriented database. <coughs> okay, so now I'm anticipating your question. So you may ask, uh, in our example, we had this company ID field that allowed us to join the tables. Usually, hierarchical data does not contain fields in all of the segments that allows you to join those segments because hierarchical database maintains parent-child relationship by itself. Uh, what can we do if we, we don't have this company ID field? How can we join those uh, segments together if we managed to uh, load them separately? <coughs> and here, Cobrix also can help you. So here is an, this same example, but only thing is missing is this company ID field. So it's, it's no, not in the copybook. The only common field that's common across all the segments is segment ID. <coughs> so what Cobrex can do for you, it can generate company IDs for you, basically. How can, uh, what, what do you need to do uh, to, to have that? So you need to add two mandatory options and one optional option. <laughs> so uh, the first, op first option, we need to specify a field that acts as a distinguisher between segments. This is our segment ID field. The second option, we need to specify which segment IDs correspond to a root level entities. In our case, uh, this segment ID is C, which means company. That way we defined all the need to do to generate a company ID. But there is a third option, so, which is like segment ID prefix. Uh, the idea is, uh, imagine you want to load the data from a mainframe, uh, and then tomorrow you want to load the data from a mainframe again. Is it the same data? You want to override the existing uh, data with a new one, or you want to add something uh, that wasn't there before? So depending on the circumstances, you want the ID to be generated deterministically, uh, then they're running the same job, you get the same IDs. <coughs> or you want to generate IDs new every time. So by default, Cobrix will generate new IDs every time. But if you want deterministic approach, if you know that you're loading absolutely the same data, you can specify ID prefix, which is ID in our case. Okay? Now, once we add those options, we will end up with this data frame that contains seg0 ID field, which you see is for peop contact people that belong to a company, it has the same value. So basically, it acts as a company ID. <coughs> The name of a field like seg0 ID, why, why it's so? It's because child segments can also have child, uh, child of their own, children of their own. So if you want to load hierarchical stru structure that has more than one levels of nesting, Cobrex can generate such IDs for you as well. It will be segment one ID and segment two ID and so on. <coughs> and now, as there is one thing left, very important thing related to uh, hierarchical databases. So, as you, th so when, a, when a hierarchical data file is located in mainframe, the access to the records is controlled by mainframe's file system. And it's very efficient uh, because of this low level and high level co uh, coupling. But when such a file is copied to, to a PC, this additional secondary indexes and the other uh, housekeeping tools used by mainframes are lost because we are copying it to file uh, in, 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 to PC which does not have such concepts. So copying tools adds headers to allow us to restore those record structure. But the file itself becomes naturally sequential. You cannot read next record from the file before you re read the previous record. So if in this, this file is 600 gigabytes, the only way you can process it is sequentially uh, because you cannot just read it in the middle because it, you cannot understand where the previous record ended and then a new record starts. 
So what can we do about it? <laughs> so before talking about how we optimize the performance, I'd like to say that uh, if you apply the naive approach of processing those records one by one, we'll get up with a very slow throughput, and it does not depend on the number of Spark calls that executors, obviously. So we'll get quite slow application. So let Felipe explain how we dealt with performance. Yeah, sure. So as you can see, uh, and then and building on top of that, you need one record to tell you when and where the next record starts. So it's naturally sequential processing. So in this case, we have the number of Spark cores on, on, on the x-axis and the megabytes per second as the throughput in the y. And you see that it's a constant 10 megabytes per second because it doesn't matter, the number of cores. You have to process one record, and then they tell you about the next one, you keep going. So if mo actually, most of the files that we have to process are uh, variable length records, so the solution would be kind of useless in this case. But we were able to solve this. And to explain the solution, we first need to uh, uh, refresh our, our memories about how Spark and HDFS integrate. So I think everyone here knows, uh, if we have a collocated cluster, Spark and HDFS cluster, um, the way HDFS divides the files is by blocks, and those blocks are converted to Spark partitions that are processed as tasks uh, by Spark executors. So you might even have some locality. Actually, you, you, ideally, you have some locality in that. So we leveraged the way this works to solve that problem. So we did this. Uh, since we have the headers of the, the records telling you about the length of the record, so we go through all the data sets and we collect the tuples composed of offsets and lengths. So we go to offset zero, and then we ask, okay, what's the length of this, file, of this uh, record? So it's X, cool. So let's jump X, go to the next header, get the, the length of the next one, and so on. So we collect these as a list of, uh, a list of uh, tuples, and then we ask Spark to parallelize these tuples. Once these tuples are parallelized, it's used by, uh, we use Spark API to do that. Okay? So we didn't have to touch any Spark internals to do that. So we ask Spark to parallelize it. And then once these tuples are uh, distributed across the cluster, we invoke Cobricks to do the parsing. So in this case, you have uh, distributed parsing of something that is inherently sequential. Okay? But what one problem that might arise here is, is this. Spark has no idea about locality here, because you're giving it a, a, a bunch of uh, 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 pairs of numbers. So it will try to distribute it evenly across the cluster. Uh, but it might be the case that you have, for instance, one offset in length, or the offset of one record that is in data node 1 being processed in data node 3. So in this case, you have like shuffle. If you have too much of this, you might bloat the network, and so that would rule off the benefits of the, the library. So what we did is we also leveraged uh, HDFS and Spark APIs, once again. So we still collect, as you can see in step one, we still collect the offsets and the lengths. But now, before asking Spark to parallelize these uh, tuples, we first ask name node where are these tuples? So for this specific file that we are processing, where is the bunch of data, where is the block that contains from this offset and this uh, until to offset uh, x to offset y? Because it's offset x plus the length, okay? So once we have uh, the nodes that contain those blocks, we give a hint to Spark using Spark API, and uh, the API is preferred locations, and then we say, okay, Spark, so for this tuple, we would like you to send this tuple to that node. This next tuple, you send to that other node. So in this case, uh, we are able to load, for instance, if the tuple one is located in data node one, we ask Spark to, to, uh, to invoke Cobricks on data node one, so we have locality. So now we have locality of a variable length record. And the final result is pretty much this. Okay, so you see, the sequential, the sequential way of processing this is this uh, continuous red line 
at the bottom of the, the graph. And then we have, if you see the green line, it's uh, for a 40 gigabytes file, that's the speed up that we had. And if we compare this graph against the graph that uses fixed length files, so we were pretty much able to match what the performance that Spark had for fixed length records. So just to, to, uh, to refresh, if you have just a fixed length record, you say, Spark, you load this amount of bytes, divide the file by this amount of bytes, and load it. So Spark, you say, OK, you data node one, you load this amount of bytes locally. So you have full locality in the first case. And in the second case, the initial approach, or the natural approach, would handle that 10 megabytes per second. But we were able to, f to, to get to uh, 145 megabytes per second, which is almost the same as 150 megabytes per second when you have full locality provided by Spark. Okay, so we have been able to solve the problem this way. Uh, okay, so now we got the performance results. We get into the final session, uh, which is uh, we would like to, to let you guys know how Cobrix plays inside the big data space in NABSA. Okay? So right now we are building a data lake uh, and, uh, from different sources. So it's a multinational company. We have databases from different countries and different pieces of technology. And uh, a lot of those data sets are stored in mainframes. So we have developed some of those tools that uh, I showed in the, in, in the beginning. And this is how it, it works. So for right now, Cobrix is powering 180 uh, uh, sources plus, which is around that number. So those, those sources go into the mainframe. Then we extract them into HDFS. And then we use Cobrix to parse them and send to another component of ours, this Enceladus. Enceladus is about conformance. So conformance is something like this. So we are based in Czech Republic, and you have the, the currency is the Czech Corona. So in some databases, it's like Czech Corona. In other ones, it's just Corona. In other ones, it's CZ key. So we want to conform this data to have, uh, so uh, for instance, CZ key for everyone, OK? But it's, uh, we are inside the financial industry, so it's a financial institution. We, we need to, to comply with regulations, so we need uh, uh, lineage, lineage tracking. So we use Spline, which is another tool that we have developed for, for Spline. So once we have it conformant, we re-ingest it into HDFS, and then it's ready for consumption. So it has been transformed, so it's an ETL process. It has been transformed, and the lineage has been tracked. Okay, so this is uh, the batch layer, of course. Now we have pretty much the same uh, on the speed layer. So we get the data from a frame. We use Cobrix. So you see now uh, here we have Cobrix on top of Spark. Here we have the Cobrix parser playing uh, standalone. So it, the, the modules are decoupled. So if you don't want to use Spark, you still can use Cobrix. Okay, so use Cobrix to extract the records. Then we use Abris, which is another library of ours. So what this library does is it converts the, the COBOL records into other records, stores the schema into schema registry so that you, yeah, you can have all the data sources uh, uh, unified. And then you have this Avro payload being sent to Kafka. From Kafka, we send it to Enceladus again, do the same conformance, uh, invoke spline, send it back to Kafka, and now it's ready for consumption. So we have this lambda architecture playing here. And this is how Cobrix is actually powering everything. OK? <coughs> so this is pretty much what we had to present. Uh, before wrapping up, we would like to thank these guys here. Otherwise, this project wouldn't have happened. OK? And of course, um, we would like to expand the Cobrix to, to be able to cope with as many mainframe technologies and copy books and constructs as possible. So <coughs> we count on you to do that. You report a bug, we are happy with you. You request a new feature, you are equally happy. But if you create a pull request, there will be Carnival, we will pay you a cup of beers, and not regular beer, Czech beers, okay, the best in the world. So. Please consider that. If you are keen to do that, that's our space on GitHub. And uh, we are happy to take your questions. Yeah. Um, how, how much work would it be to, to, uh, to, to transform or queue some of or be some files? 
So it's very interesting about how much effort is required to tra transform one file from a mainframe. Uh, so the previous process required a team of engineers to, to work on a single file for, depending on complexity, from one, one month to a half a year to design a specific program that parses a specific file into a sp different format. So for Quobrix, this effort is much, much, much less. So if the file is simple, you can probably just use it straight away. But for, for more complicated, it, it, it depends, it depends. So it, it also requires effort, it, it requires understanding. It, re it requires reading the copybook if the file is big and reading comments, how to use those fields and those. It requires some programming. But it, it requires programming using industry standard, which is Spark, so yep. no need specific uh, knowledge about specific ingestion tools. And it requires effort of one or two engineers instead of a team of specifically dedicated. Yeah, so actually what we do here is, uh, what we do here is we, so I it's expected to be uh, the fast lane but the w we have the streaming capability here because we need this file to be in HDFS first or somewhere outside the mainframe so that we can parse it, okay? Now, the way you're going to parse that file to connect it to Kafka is up to you. I if, if you want to use a simple Kafka producer, it's okay. If you want to use Spark streaming, structured streaming, you can use Abris. We developed it for structured streaming. If you want to use direct streams, up to you. So it's kind of agnostic in the sense. You see, so that, that layer that is connecting the step one to the step uh, three, I, I, it's up to you. If you want to use structured streams, we provide you with Abris. If you don't want, up to you. You can plug in uh, 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 Cobrix inside your code and whatever you decide. PL1. Okay, you needed a, sp a mainframe specialist to answer that, I think. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because, yeah, so to explain a bit more on how this project has been uh, developed so far, so we, we have been receiving, actually in the beginning, we received a bunch of copy books and they said, okay, we need to, to actually to put these guys into action. So we started to reverse engineer that and build for those. And then we started to get more and more and more copy books. So it's been built in a use case basis. This is why we are inviting the community to go there and contribute like with uh, specific knowledge such as that one. Uh, yeah, because it's, yeah, this is how the project is going on right now. Yeah, the, the, tar the, the primary target is COBOL and hierarchical databases, I IMS. Yeah, but any, any source is welcome. I, if, sure. if you have any ideas, please let us know. the ratio we did it once yeah yeah so yeah so on, on average uh, park so the size of parquet in comparison to original epsidic file is 15% 15, 15. 15. so it compresses a, a, a bit yeah yep okay cool, cool. Okay, thank, thank you. you guys <laughs>